Well, here we are, Revelation 21 to 22. Can you believe it? Uh, do you feel like you have run a biblical marathon? Like, do we need to get some stickers printed out for our cars, right? 50.0. We have made it through 50 weeks ago. We started this book in Genesis 1, and we have seen across centuries and centuries and dozens of different authors, it is not a disconnected story. It is one grand, interconnected, unified, beginning to end story. And now we find ourselves on the final page. It's the last chapter. And I want to remind you, now our seventh week in Revelation, that Revelation is an impressionist painting, right? You can't get too close, you lose uh, your, your sight for the details. You got to step back and see the big picture. And I think the last several weeks, it's been a challenge of knowing how to apply the things uh, that we've been talking about. That middle chunk of Revelation, it's thick, it's weighty, it's, it's kind of heady. And, and I think a lot of times we're just trying to figure out how to make sense of it, let alone how to apply it. So I don't know if any of you are coming in this morning going, I really don't know what to do with Revelation the last several weeks. How in the world do we apply it? What am I supposed to do? Anybody asking that question? Okay, you all have figured out the book of Revelation. Awesome, great. I'll, I'll just uh, go ahead and... Now, like, it's, it's hard, okay? It's hard. What do I do? What's the takeaway? And I want to just kind of zoom us out for a little bit and go, hey, here's what Revelation is saying as John's been pulling back the curtain to show us the reality going on all around us. It's this. We are in a spiritual war. This side of heaven, as we are awaiting Jesus' return, we're getting assaulted, you guys, every day by Satan and his three primary schemes. Number one, it is persecution. Number two, deception. Number three, seduction. And we've seen those kind of characterized in the beast, right? And the false prophet and then the harlot. These are the three things Satan's scheming. He's slamming at you day in, day out. The things at the beginning of the book, the churches that the letters were written to, they were all facing these. And we now today are doing the same Probably less so on persecution, right? Uh, I, I don't think any of us is, are, are worried this morning about getting carted off to prison for opening the Bible, but there are still things, and I see them ever increasing, how the enemy is using intimidation and fear and physical even attacks, dreams on the people of God, even in our culture. But probably more so what you're getting slammed with are those last two, right? Deception. So you've got all the, the philosophies and the wisdom of the world just pounding you, voices day in, day out, trying to lull you off of the truth of Jesus and change your value system, right? And then seduction, oh my goodness, yes. The enemy wants you to compromise from your passionate joy and love and fierce pursuit of Jesus and, and become complacent spiritually as you run to the empty wells of the world. He wants to neutralize you and just take you out of the game. That is what is happening. And the payoff here in Revelation is this. Endure. Patiently endure as we await Jesus' return, because we just saw the last few weeks, what? He wins. He wins. Satan, sin, and death are defeated. They're thrown in the lake of fire for good. And we see the one who's on the throne in the middle of it all. V-Day, as Matt had said, has come. D-Day has come. V-Day is coming. And that is sure and certain. And so in the meantime, this side of heaven, we can endure we can stay faithful. We can resist seduction and see through deception. That is the message of Revelation this far. Now, there's one more vision today, and it's a very potent ammunition in our fight to see Jesus. So if this is not our home, I think the question we have to ask as the Bible ends then is, what is our home? What, what is the end, right? Endings matter. I mean, you can have an incredible story and the ending falls flat and it leaves you let down, right? It's kind of like that bad aftertaste after a really good meal. So I don't know what stories come to your mind that you maybe walked out of the movies or closed the last page of and just were totally disappointed, right? Maybe it's if you're a classic literature fan, uh, Little Women or Huck Finn or something like that. Uh, maybe it's you went to... 
Star Wars, the last Star Wars? I didn't, but I heard the ending was really, really bad. Is that true? Yes, okay. <laughs> One person's bold enough to say it. Yeah, I think we can all agree that perhaps the most frustrating ending of all time is that of Titanic. Am I right? <laughs> You're like, Tyler, well, you knew going in what was going to happen, right? Yes, okay. I did. Anybody who's past fourth grade knew that this ship was going to sink. I'm not talking about that. But although that is crazy to know that that was coming and still leave very, very frustrated, right? You know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about the fact there's plenty of room on the door for Jack. Like, come on, right? Two people could fit on that gigantic door. Let's go. But Rose just takes it all to herself. All right, all right. Our hearts must go on. What makes a bad ending? A bad ending, there's many things, right? Sometimes it's the lack of closure and we leave confused. Sometimes evil actually seems to triumph over good. Sometimes it's just anticlimactic. It builds, 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 and then just totally falls flat. It's disappointing. Sometimes it's because it's sad. There's just tragedy like Romeo and Juliet. Sometimes it's more just so because it's boring, right? There's nothing exciting to move us Forward. A great story can crash the landing. But deep down in our hearts, we long for good endings. For the tension to be resolved, for the villains to be vanquished, for the main character to get what they were searching for, and everything to be complete and wrapped up in a bow. In fact, the best endings don't just end, they actually launch you into something new. They kind of cap what's happened, but they also set a new trajectory for something very, very hopeful moving Forward. And if this is the story, the story of all stories, then it must also be the ending. Oh, and it is. Let's go. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The third chapter of the Bible, Genesis 3, we saw Satan, sin, and death invade God's good design. Last week, the third to last chapter of the Bible, we saw God defeat Satan, sin, and death and put all those away. So Genesis 1 and 2, we got two chapters a perfect creation. Now the last two chapters of the Bible, we get a perfect re-creation. It's Eden recovered. Only actually, it's, it's better because as we're going to see today, no longer can sin and Satan tarnish it anymore. In Eden, if you can go all the way back to last August, which is very difficult to do, we saw in Eden lots of things. It was perfect. God's people in God's place with God's presence, right? And there was all these P's I laid out, like purpose and pleasure, and there's tons more P's, right? We're going to see all those P's again today, beginning right here with place. There is a new heaven and a new earth. Any of you guys a homebody? Yeah, like you maybe travel for a little bit and like, I don't know, two days and you're like, I'm ready to be home. Like, this is great. Let's come home now, right? What we have here is throughout the Bible a theme from the very beginning of home. Where ever since we were banished from God's perfect garden in the beginning, we see this pattern emerging of how is God going to bring us back home? How do we get back to Eden? In fact, the whole concept of the promised land is just that. Passing through the wilderness, God's leading them home. But the promised land doesn't actually fulfill, right? It's a bit of a letdown, and they get even exiled from it. It's still a shadow and a copy of the ultimate home that we belong to, which is why in Hebrews 11, it said that Abraham desired a better country. He was looking forward to the homeland of the city whose designer and builder was God. He knew that this was a temporary tent on earth, and he was made for something more. If you've ever lived in a foreign country, uh, or maybe you grew up moving around a lot, maybe you're military, or, or maybe just for some odd reason you really like tents, I can't understand that, but maybe you just love to sleep in tents, then you can kind of get a glimpse of what this feels like to not have a home, to not have a permanent dwelling place. I think within us all, there's something in our hearts that longs to plant roots. 
to be located in a space for a long time, to become familiar with it, to be able to say, this is mine, home is written on our hearts. And here in the opening verses of 21, we see that forever home realized. And it involves, notice, all creation, new heaven, new earth, which has been under the curse, just like us since Genesis 3, right? So not only are we broken by sin, but, but the earth is also, right? So there's dangerous weather, there's droughts and fires and scarcity of resources, and there's animals attacking, right? There's tons of shows about that. <laughs> there's earthquakes, and there's avalanches, and of course there's mosquitoes. The earth is under a curse. Romans 8 says it's groaning, waiting to be set free again. This is that setting free moment. It's the earth, but it's a new earth where the sin-tainted problems are now eradicated. And it was reset as it was originally meant to be. Now, when we say new earth, it's important to understand what we mean by new. Like new, like new pair of shoes, new. Like I like, discarded the old holy ones and got a new pair. Is that what God did with the earth? Like he just started again in Genesis 1 with a, with a new earth? Well, no, that's not what's happening. This is not an upgrade to a, a newer model. It's not a replacement. It's a restoration. Because in verse 5, look what it says. Behold, God says, I am making what all things new. All things new. Now, he doesn't say, I'm making all new things, does he? That was Genesis 1. Now he's making all things new. This is why the description we get of heaven is so much like Eden, something we're already familiar with. It's why the city, New Jerusalem, still has that word, Jerusalem. There's continuity here. I think a helpful analogy for us is the physical resurrection of our bodies. We're going to get a new body one day. But it, yeah, exactly. Amen. There's worship right there, right? But it will still resemble our old body. You're going to recognize people. It's just going to be transformed and better and without all the problems, right? I think a lot of us, if we're honest, when we start thinking about heaven, we get sad. Like a new earth, like it feels confusing and out there and foreign, right? And it's hard to get excited about heaven. We don't think of it as something physical and concrete. It's kind of abstract, vague, like harps on fluffy clouds forever, right? And that just doesn't get me going. Here's the problem with that thinking when we think, well, heaven just beyond our imagination, so I won't try to imagine it. Well, here's the problem. You can't hope for what you can't desire. And you cannot desire what you can't imagine. If heaven remains abstract and out there to you, then it will not ignite your hope. That's why many of us can't get excited. We don't see it. We don't picture it. We don't taste it. We don't smell it. And you can't really look forward to it. And so it's very easy then to get seduced back to setting up our earthly tent as home. But heaven, it's not a foreign planet. It's not an angel soft commercial on the clouds forever. It's Everything that you and I ever longed for, the Bible describes it with physical, real, spatial terms. It's a city within a country. There's walls and streets and rivers and trees and mountains and seasons and light and travel and recreation and productivity. And there's rest. There's food. There's aesthetic beauty, music, and refreshing community. There is endless pleasure in heaven This isn't a decimation of earth. It's a renewal of it. It's not termination. It's continuation, y'all. And so I I, I want you in your mind to go to your favorite vacation place ever. And I want you to, to combine what you feel there with the kind of riveting beauty and maybe the exotic colors and the excitement of adventure and just the refreshingness of that and combine that with everything that you love about home, how cozy and comfortable it is, the 40 mile per hour winds, like all those kind of things. Okay, sorry, forget that, get that out of your mind. The things that make you feel like home is home, that it's it's yours, it's, it's a haven. Combine those and that is heaven. 
I'm going to turn to C.S. Lewis. He really helps us out here. At the end of the Chronicles of Narnia, you see Lucy, Edmund, all the characters walking in to Aslan's country. And they're still mourning the loss of their beloved homeland, Narnia. But as they get deeper in, they get, begin to recognize things, hills, rivers, certain landmarks. It's familiar. Farsight the eagle spoke up, kings and queens, we have all been blind. We're only beginning to see what we, where we are. Narnia is not dead. This is Narnia. But how could it be, said Peter, for Aslan told us that we should never return to Narnia. Yes, said Eustace, and we saw it all destroyed and the sun put out. And it's all so different, said Lucy. Listen, Peter, said Lord Diggory, when Aslan said you could never go back to Narnia, he meant the Narnia you were thinking of. But that was not the real Narnia. That had a beginning and an end. It was only a shadow or a copy of the real Narnia, which has always been here and always will be here. You need not mourn over Narnia, Lucy. All of the old Narnia that mattered, all the dear creatures, have been drawn into the real Narnia through the door. And of course it is different, as different as a real thing is from a shadow or waking life is from a dream. The difference between the old Narnia and the new Narnia was, the new one was a deeper country. Every rock and flower and blade of grass looked like it meant more. I can't describe it any better than that. If you ever get there, you will know what I mean. And it was the unicorn who summed up what everyone was feeling. I have come home at last. This is my real country. I belong here. This is the land I've been looking for all of my life, though I never knew it till now. The reason why we love the old Narnia so much is because it sometimes looked a little like this. Come further up, come further in. Heaven will not be a goodbye to what we know. It will be a hello to what we always hoped for, church. Which is why in John 14, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house, there's many rooms, and I will take you to be with me. Jesus prepared a home, and he's bringing it down to us, presenting it like a wedding gift. Okay, well, heaven's not just about a place. As we move to verse 3, it's about who is there, right? Because what truly makes a house a home isn't the floor plan, right? It's not the curb appeal, uh, it's not any of those things. It is about who is in the home. So verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. It's not just our home. It's God's home. In fact, that's why it's heaven, because heaven is where God is. <laughs> what makes heaven awesome is that our awesome God is there. That God is making his home with us. Think about how crazy that is. It's Emmanuel. But it's not temporary as it was when Jesus dwelled on earth with us. Now it is permanent. It is forever. That's the question we've been asking since Genesis 3, right? How do we get back to Eden? And when we're asking that, what we're actually saying is, how do we get back to God? How do we get back to him? <laughs> he has broke open the holy of holies through the blood of Jesus, and he is ushering us in. God is our God, us as our people, which is a, a quoted promise throughout the Old Testament. I will dwell with them forever. I will be their God, and they will be my people. This is heaven. It is our salvation finally realized with unbroken fellowship with God, which was Eden's greatest attraction and the fall's greatest tragedy. It was redemption's greatest purchase and now it's heaven's greatest hope. We get God, y'all. And notice in God's presence, when we're going to keep reading, everything is good. It's very good. In fact, it's perfect. Verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither sh shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Can you even fathom that for a moment? Your most painful memories on this earth, gone. Every regret, everything that made you sad, totally 
undone and removed. No more burying loved ones. No more betrayal from friends. No more leaving home or injuries. No more divorce. No more seeing friends and family refuse Jesus. No more cancer or PTSD or poverty or abuse or sleeplessness or weariness and fatigue. All of these things gone forever. Thank you, God. Heaven has no hurts as the curse is reversed for good. And did you see? It's done not just in a wide-sweeping moment fashion, but in a really personal, intimate way where God the Father takes his hand, places it on your cheek, and wipes away not just all tears, every tear, which I think is really individual, really personal, right? Like he knows them one by one, and he systematically carterizes those wounds and heals them. What a picture of Jesus' comforting touch. Verse 4 is our absence of brokenness. But from verse 5 on, now we see the presence of blessing. It just gets better and better, and he does it by making all things new. We saw that, verse 5. But also he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Okay, everything is being new. Now, we love new, right? A world that breaks down, everything's decaying. We want new. We want new clothes. We want new episodes. We want new tools. We want new toys. We want new news right? Like, oh, that's two hours old news. Like, I need real-time live update news, right? We want new. Now, some of you are like, no, I'm not that person. I'm a vintage person, Tyler. I listen to classics, okay? I shop at antique stores. I repurpose things. I duct tape my shoes, right? I have a flip phone. I don't know. I'm old school. Hey, that's great. Congratulations, first of all. Uh, But second, All of us, no matter how much you love those kinds of things, there are things that undoubtedly we want new, right? Food. (laughs) You do not want old and decaying and broken down food. Uh, Your body, right? We already heard amens and loud shouts about that, right? How about an airplane engine? Probably want new, right? You don't want the broken down version of that when you step on the tarmac. We want new. And even if you're... re kind of putting parts back together and repurposing, all that is showing is that there's something deep within us that wants restoration, that wants things to be made new. That's a craving for eternity inside of us. Because Jesus now is making all things new. No more expiration dates. And that truth is firm. He's a trustworthy source. This isn't an empty sales pitch because he's sealed it with his blood. Just bank on it. Mark it down. This is trustworthy and true. And, and, and it is so because, look at the next verse, he sacrificed everything for us to make it true. And he said to me, it is done. Does that perk your ears? It is finished, his cry on the cross. It's accomplished. Everything I've need, that we've needed to have heaven secured for us has already been accomplished. It's certain, and you cannot unfix it. It's finished. I'm the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. God, the one who's there before Genesis 1, will be there after Genesis or uh, Revelation 22. It's forever. And not only is it forever, look at this last part of verse 6. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The satisfying picture of life with God in heaven, it costs you nothing. In fact, you can't earn it. <laughs> There's nothing that you could or I could ever do to deserve it. It is not by our, our righteousness that this heaven is secured, but Jesus' righteousness. And so he says, hey, this fresh and forever and firm picture of heaven is also free. It's for you without cost, without payment. Come and delight and take from the water of life. But it won't be, verse 7 and 8, enjoyed by everyone. There are two types of people. There are those whose reward is this heaven because they trusted Jesus and there are those whose inheritance, whose future is held because they refused the grace of Jesus. And so lest we get lulled in by this beautiful picture of heaven and think that everyone's going there, that's called universalism. 
There is a contingency here, and it's contingent on how you and I have responded to Jesus. And maybe you read verse 8 and you go, well, oh no, that's me. Like, liar? Oh no, I've done that, right? You start reading this list of sins, and you're like, I, I'm hosed. Like, I'm not going to make it in to heaven, but, but hear this. This is not about how faithful and faultless you were at accomplishing these things. It's about what? How forgiven you are. This is why Corinthians 6 says the list of sins, and then it says, but that's what some of you were, but you were washed. You were cleansed. You were forgiven the blood of Jesus. So entrance into this heaven is built squarely on our response to Jesus. God's presence, God's place. Verse 9 through 26 is going to show us that we're not alone. There's God's people there. Verse 9. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the last seven plagues. And he spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. That's the church, the bride, right? Now, he carried me away, verse 10, in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the bride. No, showed me what? The holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. I'll show you a people and he shows us a place. Why? Because a city is its people. Right? It's not just buildings, it's the citizens of the people. This is not an uninhabited city in heaven. Heaven is not just a place, it is a people marked by the glory of God. And if you keep reading the next 10 verses, talk about what this city is arrayed in, all the jewels, the beautiful building materials, pure gold, all the, the rare things, clear crystal. And what it's showing here is that you and I, as God's people saved by Jesus are first prized. We are valuable and we're precious to God, which is hard for some of you to to think about, right? You're like, I'm so screwed up. Like, God's going to be disappointed when I step into heaven. If heaven's perfect, I'm going to mess it up. But that's not at all the picture of our God. He's already talking about you as his bride. Bride, the picture of last week, the chapter 20, is a wedding feast, okay? You guys know the moment the bride steps in? Like, what happens? Everyone snaps their head around, right? All attention fixed on her. Now, I I do weddings, and so I get a chance to see there's a couple of people who don't snap their head around, and what? They look at the groom. They want to see his eyes as he beholds his white-dressed wife for the first time. And what's happening in that man? Oh, my goodness. Like, the most hardened dude is, like, bawling up tears, right, as emotions just explode out of him. This is the moment he's been waiting for, that he's invested so much for. When you get to heaven, Jesus is going to rejoice that you're there. He cannot wait to spend eternity with you. You are prized and precious in his sight. You are also pure, though, the picture of this with these jewels. These are the jewels that, are, that were listed in Leviticus and Exodus that, that the priest would wear going into the Holy of Holies. And he's saying, hey, look, you're all now having access to my presence. I have made you holy. <laughs> Y'all, our, our sanctification is complete in this moment. No more in process. This is heaven, all of God's people, and it's from all time. Did you notice the 12 gates, the Old Testament tribes of Israel, the 12 foundation, the New Testament apostles? He's saying there's not two cities. This is one unified, multi-ethnic people rallied around one thing, the blood of God. Jesus. When we get to heaven, heaven's not colorblind or cultureless, okay? Look at verse 26. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, the diversity of God's global people right here in heaven, redeemed and submitted to the glory of God. We're not, it's not a uniformity, it is a unity with all of the beautiful variety of God's creation. This is God's people in God's place, with God's presence. What a picture. There's a few more blessings that I want to highlight before we wrap it up. 
We're seeing the city an enormously thick wall, and it shows us that there's protection there. There's invulnerability, right? The gates will never be shut, meaning there's no threats. There's no darkness because God himself is the light. Total safety, y'all. There's not just protection, there's also purity. There's temple imagery. In verse 22, it says there's no temple in the city because what? God himself is the temple. You're there. Like in the Old Testament, you had to go into the temple to, quote, be with God. Now we're already there. We're with God. There's no temple. He is here. We're standing on holy ground. Everywhere you walk is holy ground because he's there. And there's no sin. There's no stain. Look at verse 27. Nothing unclean will ever enter it, right? Heaven is totally pure. In chapter 22, we see another blessing. We see provision. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life. Okay. Whoa. River of life. Tree of life. Ears perking up here. Do you remember these things? Yeah, the Bible is ending where it began, right? And flowing from the very presence, from the throne of God himself, is everything that you and I need, his satisfying source of life. This is the Isaiah 55, come to the waters, you who are thirsty, come by and eat. This is the John 4, where Jesus tells the woman at the well, hey, if you drink of my water, You'll never go thirsty again. This is it. Come, eat of the tree of life. This is what Adam and Eve forfeited in the garden, right? Because they ate the wrong tree. There is no wrong tree now in heaven. It's just eat a buffet of God's provision. Come and feast. It's not just provision. There's even an extra layer of it. There is pleasure because this picture of provision isn't just for our basic needs, you guys. It is, but it's also our senses are being stoked and satisfied in some awesome ways here. This picture of the tree of life, it has 12 variety of fruits for every month of the year, like symbolizing the variety of flavors. There's no longer, verse 3, anything accursed. There's no prohibitions, no trees off limits. Remember, Eden equals pleasure then you better believe the new heavens and new earth have pleasure. If it's a wedding feast, weddings are fun, right? We're dancing, we're singing, we're laughing, we're celebrating. It's a party scene. Many of you in the room, and I know, I was there for a while, think, this goes back to what we said earlier, heaven's boring. If you're honest, like, you're like, yeah, I kind of, you know, I do. Heaven's boring boring. Give us this old, musty church service where we're just singing hymns on repeat, right? And you're like, ah, not for me. And then you feel guilty because you're not spiritual enough for wanting that. (laughs) Like, anybody play that game? We need to debunk this lame picture. Uh, Here's what Randy Alcorn says. I love this. He says, our underlying belief that heaven is boring betrays a deep heresy that we think God is somehow boring, right? The one who made taste buds and adrenaline, who invented laughter and designed dance and formed coffee beans, oh yeah. The God of colors, the God of flavors, the God of seasons, the God of sunsets. He set in motion shooting stars, spoke out notes and music bars. He breathed the wind and whipped up water, sculpted mountains like a potter. He designed brains, assigned names, defined veins, and lined planes. He's the mastermind behind flames. And DNA DNA combined chains. He fashioned drops of dopamine. He painted pines with evergreen. He conceived the deep submarine. And don't forget that coffee bean. 
He carved out coconuts and crabs, thought up leopard spots and labs. He activated rolling waves. He instigated Sabbath days, calculated solar rays, hydrated grass for cows to graze, all dictated by a word or phrase, cultivated sandy bays and regulated geyser sprays, illuminated fires blaze. He mandated holidays and celebrated runaways who were liberated from their haze. He's the shepherd of the sheep that strays. He's fascinated every gaze, captivated and amazed, for never boring are his ways. In all creation, he displays that heaven's full of endless praise. Everything interesting, everything refreshing, everything stimulating and beautiful and enjoyably good about life comes from him. Heaven is an ever-increasing reservoir of pleasure and adventure and wonder. There's two more components here in Verse 3, it says, in this tree of life, there is healing for the nations. Now, that's important. It's not just no more pain moving forward. It's actual healing of all past pain. The word in Greek is therapeia, therapy, therapeutic, cure, a remedy. I think a helpful word in Hebrew is shalom, which is a word for peace, but it's really a, a deeper word than that. It's a word for wholeness. There's, everything is whole. It's not fragmented anymore. It's whole. There's peace, no more tension, no more anxiety, no more angst, holistic peace. There's also, though, lastly, in verse 3 through 5, there's purpose. Because what we see in verses 3 through 5 is the scene ends with us worshiping God face to face. And then it says we'll reign forever and ever with him, which is exactly what Genesis 2 said we were put in the garden to do, to worship and obey, to enjoy God's goodness forever in his presence, and then to be his royal ambassadors, imaging him and carrying out, executing his divine will, exercising dominion over creation. Guess what? That's what we're doing in heaven. We're not sitting on our thumbs, right? We're not, we're just on the sidelines, bored for eternity. We're active participants with God and his kingdom rule. And so the Bible ends where it began, God's people in God's place with God's presence and all the blessings that come with that. It's Eden, only better. Just like that, that wedding day picture, a culmination of everything that's been there. The waiting is over, but also what? A launching into what is to come. <laughs> a new life forward. That's what we see in Revelation 21 and 22. What do we do with this? Well, I think the final 15 verses are a bit of an epilogue. We're going to race through them. They're the the parting words, and and God in his wisdom and kindness is giving us direction on what to do with this picture of heaven. The first thing he tells us in verse 6, and he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. Again, we see that, right? Right? The first thing we need to do is trust these words. It's not fantasy. It's an apocalyptic prophecy book. So we tend to go, okay, cool, yeah, well, it's out there. It's trustworthy. It's true. Jesus himself is speaking, and he does not speak wasted or wrong words. Take it to the bank. And by the way, later it says, don't add to these words. Don't take away from these words, right? Which is a tendency to do, again, in a prophetic book. Oh, I maybe have a new prophecy or an interesting hot take on this. And we begin to skew things, and he's going, All you need is right here. This is sufficient. Don't add any other books to this. Trust these words. Number two, the worship God, not the messengers, or even the message. Because in all the grandeur of heaven, John falls on his face. This is verse 8. And he begins to direct his his worship wrongfully towards the angel that was right there showing him everything. And the angel goes, no, don't even get close to me with that. Worship the one on the throne. In this book, you and I can get fixated on angels or demons or beasts or John or elders around the throne or whatever, and we miss the lion and the lamb, Jesus. Remember chapter one, week one, a revelation of what? Jesus. 
His words are about him. Let's not miss the main character and the main point. This is about worshiping him. Number three, keep these words. And behold, I'm coming soon, verse seven. Blessed is the one, this is a repeat from chapter one, who keeps these words. How do you keep these words? So I, we said it at the beginning of the sermon, right? Endure patiently. Endure through persecution. Resist the world's seduction. See through the enemy's deception. Hold fast to Jesus. As you remember, this is not your home. Our home is coming. That's how you keep these words. Number four, don't seal them up. Verse 10. These words are meant to be shared. As the band comes up and we get ready to respond, I think we got to see the urgency here of evangelism, y'all. He's going to show us yet again another picture of this heaven isn't for everyone. There are those who persist in evil, who reject Jesus' grace, and they will not spend eternity in heaven. This is urgent. This is urgent. Don't seal these words up. Keep these on your lips, which is why verse 17 says the invitation it does. The spirit and the bride, that's us, say, come. Come. And let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price, come. Oh, come to Jesus. Lost and dying world, neighbors and family members and coworkers, come to the wedding feast. Come to the holy city. Come to the water of life. You'll never thirst again. Maybe that's actually even you this morning. Maybe you've never trusted Jesus. Maybe you've even played the church game for a long time, but you have never actually staked your life on the claims of Jesus and said, yeah, I'm in. I'm all in. That can be today. Come. And last, eagerly desire his return. Verse 20, he who testifies to these things says, and here's the third time we hear it, surely I am coming soon. In case you doubt it and in case it drifts to the back of your mind, Jesus emphasizes, he repeats it three times, behold, I'm coming soon. I will crack open the sky and I will do everything that you have just read about in this book. And do you see John's response? Amen, come Lord Jesus. That's our heart's cry to this as we see heaven come. Yes, Jesus, I'm tired of this tent. I'm ready to see you face to face. Would you please let your kingdom come? That's our prayer today. For our citizenship is in heaven and from it we eagerly await our Savior. When you say, come Lord Jesus, you are correcting your hope off of the false promises of the world and you're centering it on where it ought to be. Behold, I'm coming soon. Because the world around us, church, hear this, it thinks we're absurd and foolish for thinking that a man 2,000 years ago reigns in heaven and is returning again to judge the world and restore his saved people back to himself and a forever home. I think that's crazy. Don't lose sight of these truths. Fix your gaze on the one who's coming soon. Behold him. I'm going to end just sharing a story of a young woman in 1952 named Florence Chadwick. She stepped into the cold waters of the Pacific Ocean off of Catalina Island. She was going to swim the 26 miles to the California coast. She'd already become the first woman who swam the English Channel both ways, and so she was setting her sights higher on this longer swim, but as she did, the, a thick fog set in. And it was disorienting. She could barely even see the boats around her, and yet still she swam. For 15 hours, she swam. As she was ready to get taken out of the water. She was exhausted. 
Her mom was right there in the boat encouraging her. You're almost there. You're almost there. Finally, she quit. She couldn't take it anymore. They stopped swimming, and she pulled her out into the boat, and it was once she got up into the boat, she discovered she was less than a mile from the shore. And she said the next day in a a news conference, if I could only have just seen the shore, I would have made it. If I could just see the shore. She was determined a few months later, she went back to do it again. A thick fog set in again, but she did it. She made it the whole way. And she said afterwards, she had a picture in her mind the whole time of that shoreline. She never let it out of her sights. Church, let's see the shore as we await his return. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you are coming again. Help us when our hearts don't anticipate or long for your return, when we don't see the beauty of a heavenly home of life forever with you. Help us, God. Keep us from setting up shop in this tent. Help us from being lulled and to compromise and complacency with the world right now. Help us see through that deception and to see the beauty of this vision today. Life forever with you. Help us see the shore. Would you etch this picture into our mind? Would you burn it onto our souls, Lord, that we would be heavenly minded and run the rest of our days with patient endurance and purpose in Jesus' name. Amen.